Welcome, welcome to today's webinar. I'm so excited about our webinar topic today and our guest. Oh, I'm very excited. So come on in, everyone. You already are telling us where you're coming in from. We've got the Bahamas and Florida, Tennessee. Yes, please say hello, Canada. Well, welcome, welcome to five strategies for a standout career as an assistant. I am really excited, as I said, about our guest today, Alexandra von Tiergarten. And I will tell you more about Alexandra shortly. You can see her down there in the corner. So in case you haven't been at any of our webinars where I have guests, these are conversational webinars. So it's more uh, of I'm having a conversation with my guest. However, it is packed with education and information, and you'll definitely want to take notes today. So a few things first as far as our logistics. The educational part of the webinar is about 45 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A, and then we'll have a wrap-up. And I have a special announcement today, so if you can stay on to the end, please do so. You can post your questions anytime during the webinar, or you could save them to the end. And then Malia Miro will be our moderator for the webinar. And last, you will receive a recording of today's webinar. So if you miss anything or you want to go back and hear all the great information that's going to be shared with you, please do so. So keep coming in. Let's see, who else do we have? Illinois, Chicago. I'd love to see where everybody's visiting from. So let me introduce my guest today. Alexandra von Tiergarten is a district president for Robert Half, the world's first and largest specialized talent solutions firm. In her role, she oversees the company's finance and accounting permanent placement, contract finance and accounting, full-time engagement professionals, and administrative and customer support operations in North Orange County, Los Angeles, Ventura County and Santa Barbara. Alexandra began her career with Robert Half in 2003 and has been dedicated to assisting companies throughout Southern California to find top talent and professionals with rewarding careers. On a personal note, I have known Alexandra for several years now, I believe, right? <laughs> and she has presented at our conferences in the past, and I'm so excited she's coming back this October. So if you can get to Las Vegas, please come. She's going to speak on an entirely different topic. And uh, Alexandra and I have had several wonderful conversations over the years, she shares with me, you know, what's trending, what's going on in the profession, but also really what's important when if you are looking for a, a job placement and so forth and what skills you need and competencies. So without further ado, let's get started with Alexandra. And we have five strategies. Uh, we carefully selected these. We had great discussions about these different topics. And so this is what we chose for you today and what Alexandra is going to share a lot of ideas with you. So number one, a hot topic we've been hearing about forever, AI and future proofing your career. So we know AI is everywhere. I'm really curious too, how many of you are now using this in your workplace? So if you are, because I know it's changing and for months it wasn't being utilized in certain organizations, but I believe that number's definitely increased. So if you are now using AI in your organization, even if you're not actually using it, would you please put a Y in the chat? I'd be interested to know that. So it definitely is a hot topic. We've been talking on this topic for over a year, actually, here at Office Dynamics, but we definitely intensified the conversation as we see the emergence in the workplace. And so um, we have something specific we want to focus on with you today. And so when we were discussing it, we were talking about, I know from my end, the human element and how important that is. I firmly believe in using AI. I think there are so many benefits to it. 
And yet I want to make sure we don't forget where the human element is really needed and necessary. And so then I was sharing with Alexandra of uh, something Brian Burge, our VP of business strategy, said to me about a month ago, two months ago. He had come in and we were talking about it. And he said um, he had read that or he came up with this idea from seeing it in a legal uh, capacity. AI may not replace you, right? Because we talk about AI, you know, don't let it replace you. But an assistant who knows how to utilize AI may replace you if you haven't been learning about AI and utilizing AI. And I, I thought that was quite insightful. And so when I shared that with Alexandra, she said, I've got my notes here. You said something, uh, you called this the opportunity zone. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. <laughs> Sure Absolutely. So, um, so hopefully you all can hear me. Um, you know, it's just a huge area of opportunity for all, um, all of us, really. Um, but I definitely see for you know professional administrative assistance, it's going to take you to the next level. And so, learning it, practicing it in your free time to make sure that you understand how powerful the tool is. So there's been, you know, some fear in the marketplace. Is it going to replace jobs? You know, like the quote that Joan said, I really see it as it's going to bring your skills to the next level. So what can you do? How can you help? How can you better everything that you're preparing by having AI do some of that foundation work for you? But the only way to be good at AI is to know how to put the right prompts in and to practice. So my suggestion suggestion is before your workplace is asking you to utilize AI to bring your work products to the next level, you're practicing it on the side and you're becoming the expert that you bring into the workplace. So um, you want to be that person that everyone's coming to and saying, gosh, how are you using this? You know, how are you finding these amazing ways to make your work better? Makes you invaluable. Yeah. And there are, are uh, some very specific um, examples of how assistants are utilizing AI, right, in the different facets of their job. I mean, I my preference or what the tool I use is chat, right? I love it. Yeah. So I've asked it, how do assistants specifically, how can they and where can they use AI? And it, I think it gave me about 14 different areas, you know, everything ranging from calendars to project management and so forth. And so it is exciting. I think it is very exciting. Um, Alexandra, I especially liked, and, and something I've been working on for over a year, is learning about asking, you know, the prompt has to be right. I mean, you only get from AI what you put into it, right? And so I think that's a real skill that you identified as learning the prompts. Um, and, and I would also say, Joan, too, learning to refine it. So let's say what it gives you. So uh -huh. perhaps, you know, you work for a nonprofit and you're trying to help them write a pitch letter, you know, for a grant. Let's just use that as an example. And okay. um, and what it gives you is way too long. Then you want to learn the ways to refine it, to simplify it or what it's giving you, you don't think is using sophisticated enough words. So you ask it, you know, to be better, right? You know, how can we use more sophisticated words? So all of these things will switch and change what it's giving you. And then I like to tell people that that's your foundation. Then you're gonna take what it's giving you, you're gonna personalize it. You know, you're gonna make it sound like it comes from you or make it sound like it comes from the person that you're supporting. Um, and then it just takes so much time away to create the structure and foundation of, a, of any document. Okay, great. So if you have questions about AI, we could talk more about that later. Um, but we're gonna move on to number two because this is a, one of our favorite topics, I know that. And the number two strategy is elevating communication skills. So if you want to jot that down. So whether you're utilizing your communication skills in virtual settings or in person, um, and I know 
we could talk about this. Alexander and I could talk about this for days, even weeks. I mean, we've been teaching communication skills since 1990, and there's always something to add and always uh, ways to you know, evolve in that area. And so we're narrowing this down and there are a few key areas that Alexandra wants to address. She's gonna cover some topics that we've decided on with a hybrid environment and communications, being effective in a virtual and in office mediums, business speak, which that's gonna be fun to talk about, being somewhat bold in Zoom meetings. So that's going to be intriguing. So Alexandra, let's start with the first piece um, that you, I know, had shared with me about the hybrid offices and being effective, you know, in that meeting, in those, uh, whether you're in person or virtual mm -hmm. and how to modulate yourself in the office. You said something about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, um, most or let's say a lot of companies are working in a hybrid model where there's certain business communication where you're on a Zoom platform like we're talking today. Um, there's certain times that you're in the office and it's really changed the landscape of how we're communicating as a group. So you've got to have certain communication skills that you use in a virtual setting and then certain that you're using in the office. So I think learning to speak up in a virtual setting, um, but not being the one that's always talking. Right. So kind of learning that. And and I would say being concise. So one of the things that, you know, we see and sometimes our clients bring to us is, you know, that their employees are verbose on a virtual setting or they try to take over, you know, um, the virtual meeting or conversely, they put their camera off and they don't speak in a virtual meeting. So when you think of how powerful, you know, how you communicate in that meeting is, you know, think about your thoughts in a bullet point standpoint, instead of just kind of blurting things out. That's really important when we only get a little snippet. Mm -hmm. So and it's, it is really interesting, you know, working through your, your two environments, because we, I would, I guess we are hybrid, even though we're five days a week, but we do have some of our staff who do work from home on certain days. Um, and it's just interesting to see that, um, one, the different mediums talking on the phone or will will FaceTime each other, right? Um, and then try to do that. And it, that's what's interesting, too, speaking of that. I do have a full-time remote employee, and we, we will FaceTime sometimes. And so, but he's our creative person. And so it is so difficult to actually try to talk to someone, even though I'm looking at him, but we're talking about a visual document, <laughs> right? Where I'm trying to show him and say, well, look here, you know, you've got to look here. So I think that goes to as well, realizing when that medium doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then you need to go to uh, where we'll go on to a Zoom or Google Meets, whatever, mm -hmm. and realizing. So I think, could you speak to that too? Too, that whether you're in the office or out of the office, knowing which medium is going to be the most effective. Yeah. And I think some, sometimes you will have people that are out of the office, you know, you're in the office and you're still on a virtual call, right? <laughs> because you've got people out of the office and people in the office. So I think it's um, one, always make use of your in-office time with the people that you work for. Right. Make sure that that is um, something that you're thinking about, how you're going to communicate with them, because it is the most powerful. But if your job happens to be fully remote all the time, then you just have to use these different skills to make sure that when you're you know, in that medium, that you have that time. And let's say to Joan's point, the virtual meeting is completely just sharing a document and nobody can see each other. What do you do to make sure that you get that one on one time afterwards? Right. What can you do to make yourself stand out? Like maybe you ask for a quick meeting after the meeting that's virtual and you can talk about, you know, whatever you want to do to do with the next project that's going on or something. If you feel like, 
you know, a significant amount of time has gone by and you've had no true interaction. That's a good point. And you just reminded me when you said to stand out, that's what we're talking about, standing out as that assistant. So um, I think that's really important. You, what I've noticed over the years, for so many years, people got used to working from home, working siloed. Mm -hmm. And then as they're coming back into the offices, they're still siloing themselves in their workspace. That it's like they're still doing that. And so, but if you're going to stand out, you have to be seen, you have to be heard. Like you said, when you're in person, take advantage mm -hmm. of being in front of people, right? Yeah, I think that, you know, the pandemic has shifted people to a little bit more of introverted personalities in general. And because we've spent so much time working from home or, you know, some people like, you know, spent four years and now all of a sudden they're going back into the office two days a week. And we're trying to figure out what does that mean? How do I stand up? How, how do I stand out? How do I change, you know, um, my, you know, the way that I'm my business speak, as I mentioned to you, or, you know, my business communication style now that I'm not at home all the time, right? How am I going to make that? How am I going to make that shift? And I do see that people tend to be a little bit more shy now. You know, we're even seeing that um, with the, you know, youngest generation that's coming out of college who went to school, you know, a certain amount of their high school maybe was, um, was remote and a certain amount of their college was remote and they're coming into the workforce now. And, you know, all of these skills are so necessary to continue to um, push yourself in your career. And so I would just urge people to try to come out of their comfort zone and begin to figure out ways of standing out, right? How do you suggest, you know, um, maybe something for a project that's going on in your office, you know, think about what creative ways could we accomplish this? What can I bring to that that may be unique to the other staff that's in the office? You know, and ask questions, right? What else can I help with? You know, how else can I be valuable to the organization? So I think, you know, being bold in that particular way, um, when maybe you feel a little bit shy because we're, you know, we're not used to it as much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And then, so that leads to the business speak, actually, because yeah, that was another facet we talked about. And so this was kind of fun because um, I had a feeling I knew what Alexandra was talking about. We've called it executive speak all the years, but I think we're saying the same thing um, and, and what it really ends up being in the characteristics of that. So could you share and expand on business speak and what, what really is that and why is it important for assistants to really um, learn to communicate in that fashion? Well, I think especially with assistance, you know, you're supporting someone who probably has a lot on their plate and less time to talk to you as their assistant. They just want you to be taking care of things. And so if you always have an agenda together when you're speaking to the person that you're reporting to or who you're helping on a project, then you're going to be more efficient in that particular meeting. And so my suggestion is to think in that bullet pointed manner and, and have notes prepared ready when you walk into any sort of interaction with who you're supporting. Don't just go in and think, okay, it's all in my head. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be able to say what I need to say. Because oftentimes then you might miss something that is really powerful that you wanted to talk about because it, it just, it wasn't in an organized manner ready to go. So my suggestion is always have those things written out. And, and then, you know, you might have situations where the person you're reporting to says, I don't have any more time. I just have, you know, I've got one more minute. I've got to get on a call or I got to get on a conference call. And then you say, okay, there's only two more points that I have. Mm -hmm. You know, when could we get to those? And you'll know that if you have it prepared and you have it with you. That's a great idea. And I feel too, like, because uh, we talk about having notes and being prepared um, for your conversations with your leaders. Um, and putting those really important uh, questions or ideas up front so that if your time is cut short, you've gotten to your main points 
up front, <laughs> right? Yeah, cover the most that's, important that's first, exactly right? Exactly being a strategic thinker because we talk about, you know, uh, this is a whole different subject, but over the past year and a half, we've been focusing heavily on strategic thinking for assistance. So it's not just having the skill to do it, but are you strategic? Are you a strategic thinker? Are you again like I'm thinking about the positioning? If Alexandra is my leader and I'm going to meet with her, I want to get my most important points out right away because if she has to leave, I've at least addressed those. So there is a strategy too that we should put behind. Um, our communications, like it's so important to me, communications. And also we only have such a short period of time to get people's attention today. Short. Uh, I know for me, you better grab me right away or I'm going to be off thinking about other things. So that allows that, correct? When you're you're talking. Yeah. You and I think you are, you know, your bosses and the executives that you support will appreciate that. They'll appreciate you being concise. They'll appreciate what you're bringing to them and just understanding, okay, these are the questions that they have, or this is the suggestions, right? And and that that will be rewarded. Yeah. And another, so another piece I'd like to talk about too, I just was thinking of the, this, is um, the actual words uh, that are used. So in our executive speak, and. I want you to contribute, Alexandra, and those of you who are attending, I want you to contribute. So we uh, have in one of our workbooks, the words, some of the words that I have heard executives use over and over and over for years. And they like to talk about get in the game and holistic and flawless execution. So it's actual, what are the actual words that executives use because if you mirror their words they're going to view you more as a business partner mm -hmm. so what are some other would you say ex executive words actually that maybe you hear repeatedly um, or that could help an assistant align more with leadership i mean i i like it in the game i think you know i think also you know just saying like, these are the most important points, or this is what I want to bring to your attention, or have you thought about this? You know, should we look in this other direction, right? Because really you're thinking about yourself as somebody that is, you know, helping make change, right? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes in an assistant position, we can be thinking of ourselves in a passive manner. We're there to do the things that are the function of our job. But how do you make yourself invaluable? That's because you're trying to make suggestions that would be change, that would be helpful to the company, right? So don't just do the work that's in the description of your job, right? Think bigger and bring those suggestions. Okay, thank you. Um, then, so I wanted to, we're gonna go on to the next one, but quickly I wanted to go back to, uh, where you had made the comment about being somewhat bold in the Zoom meetings, but I know you weren't meaning being aggressive. Correct. Can, so can you tie back yeah. to that a little bit? Of course, of course. So, you know, all of us sit in Zoom meetings and there will be regular people within your office environment that will always be off camera who will never speak in the meeting. And so I think what I am, you know, suggesting and encouraging all of you to do is one, do not be that person, right? Be ready to be on camera, you know, when you're in the meeting, if that's appropriate for the meeting and, and then be prepared with something to ask about. So, you know, when, when I find myself on Zoom meetings where I'm having to ask people if they have an opinion on something, please give an opinion. Right. That's an additional task for me as the executive. Mm -hmm. So I love it when, you know, some, you know, and you have to look to what is the culture of the Zoom meeting. So is it a culture that people need to use those icons, you know, to raise their hand if they have a question 
or is it a small group where you can just easily, you know, kind of wait for a breath, you know, in the speaker and then, you know, you know, ask your question. So it just kind of depends on the environment and what is appropriate, but make sure that if it is appropriate for you to be talking in the meeting, if it does make sense for you to be adding and contributing, that you are that person. Now, we're not going to be on every single day. Every day, we're not going to have a million and one ideas. So that's okay, you know, but just make sure when you think about, okay, over the course of the last couple of weeks, when I've had an opportunity to contribute, how did I contribute? How did I make a difference? You know, how did I stand out? And so that's my being bold. But to Joan's point, you don't want to be annoying. You don't want to be oversharing or over talking. So that's just something to modulate and, you know, that we all have to do in our own personality. Um, but I would just say, if you are more of the quieter type, then I would use the word bold for you. Um, I don't use it for myself. I'm not a quiet type. So I just have to say contribute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, interestingly, that actually ties into our number three standout strategy, understanding work culture. So there were a couple ideas under there. It's understanding the nuances of your work environment and learning how to align your personal brand with the organizational culture. So I guess we're kind of building on what you were just saying. Yeah. So I think, you know, again, this goes back to what is the environment, um, both from an in-person perspective to a virtual perspective. So in order to create your own personal brand, that's a lot of different factors. So that's how you present yourself, both from how you dress for work, you know, how you put yourself together in a professional manner, is that appropriate for your workplace? Is your workplace a business casual workplace or is your workplace a very casual workplace? So my suggestion always is to be a step above, you know, kind of the lower end of the environment. So if you, you know, if you have an environment that's business casual, then you dress business casual. You don't need to be in a suit, you know, um, every day, but you are, you know, kind of the upper echelon versus if it's a casual environment, you're not the most casual person, right? You just want to be a little step up in terms of how you present yourself from a clothing um, perspective. But in terms of your personal brand, that also is, how do you present yourself? How do you speak? You know, what are the words that you use? And, um, you know, just just watching all of that. Everything has gotten so casual, you know, post pandemic. And I think both from how we present ourselves overall, but also how we speak and the words that we use. So, you know, just really looking at that, that how does that reflect upon me? Right. Am I going to be looked at for that next role, that next promotion, or am I aligning myself, you know, with with, you know, maybe lower level positions when I really want to rise? Mm -hmm. That's really good. Um, and I was just thinking as you were talking this piece about the protocol and the etiquette and communication. So interestingly, a few weeks ago, we had an office dynamics two day all hands on deck team meeting. Um, it was great because we haven't all gotten together for two days. I don't know when since last year. Yeah. And we've all been busy and doing our thing, but we do have our meetings. But this was a two day fully focused on all facets office dynamics. And one area I did spend a lot of time on with my team was communications in terms of protocol and etiquette. And we got down even our emails and we even dug into, um, uh, this is how my new we got, is when you have emails going back and forth or when you email somebody to say, hi, hello, say <laughs> something, good morning, happy Monday. Don't just jump into a topic, it's not text. So we dug into it though. My team was really curious that uh, one of my team members, if we're going back and forth though, let's say Alexandra, you and I, in a short period of time, they thought it was, it seemed silly to keep saying hi, hi, right. hi. Right. And I, so here I go, like I do my research. I'm fully into researching. 
maybe I, I don't know everything. What is the rule? And so we researched it just, you know, uh, recently. And it said, if it's in a short span of time, you don't have to say hi every time. Mm -hmm. But if several hours have passed, it is appropriate that you again say hello. So I think, you know, these are, they might seem minute to people and like, oh, that's such a little picky, unique thing. But that's what makes one person stand out mm -hmm. over another employee. I view it as if I have five people come in and they they assistants and I've got one position um, or let's say a, a person in the company um, and they're equal in skill and they have a good attitude and they they are, you know, present pretty well and professionally. Now I've got to get down to every little intricacy. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to make somebody stand out to me is how they're communicating with me maybe via email. Like I told you, we just have a new hire who's starting next week. And the last few months, I've been very impressed. Like she responds within a very short amount of time to my emails. She's very, uh, she's articulate, she's professional, and yet she's friendly. Do you see, instantly I could describe her brand mm -hmm. in communication. So we're only touching the surface today. But I want to encourage all of you to dig in to all facets of communication. And the protocol is always changing. And again, don't do what everybody else is doing. I always say this. My team will say, well, no one else does that. I'm like, well, yeah, if everyone else jumps off a bridge, are you going to go follow them? Like, come on, you've got you've to use your brain. And again, that's what you're saying to Alexandra is go a notch above. Go yeah. a step above because a lot of people don't know really where they're going because they're not taking the time to figure out what's going to make them shine the most. And I think I think you touched on something really important when you touch on email etiquette and saying hello, um, you know, it's kindness, right? Mm -hmm. And within an office culture, there's been a little bit of a loss of that, right? With not being around each other as much and mm -hmm. maybe not, you know, we don't know when everyone is going on vacation or we don't know everything, little thing that goes on in everyone's life now if we're not all together five days a week. Right. And I and I think, you know, adding that little bit of kindness, you never know who it is that you're interacting with and when or if they will be asked about your work product, you know, and you've always been kind to them. And I would say, secondly, taking that time to read through your emails before you send them making sure there's no grammatical errors, making sure there's no spelling errors. We can be typing so fast on our phones and this happens in text as well. It happens in chat. We've got all these different apps on our phone that we're communicating business-wise with our colleagues. And sometimes that speed can put the wrong word in, right? Your phone can auto-correct you. So I would just say to also you know, spend a little extra time, an extra five seconds, 10 seconds to read whenever you're interacting with anybody before you hit send, whether it's an email, right? It's on chat, it's on text, um, because the, it's all business communication now. It's just in different forms. And then, you know, it also say the use of emojis, you know, that, is that your business culture, right? Do they like to put the smiley faces or is it not? And just to be very careful um, in that regard, because you never know if you send the wrong emoji to the wrong person, how that reflects upon you. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now our number four, we're going to go on the other side of communications, because often when we talk about communications, we, we do talk about us as the senders of information and not the receivers. And so number four strategy is active listening skills. Um, so I'm going to let you take over from there. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, you know, the, mo one of the most important pieces is to listen to the person that you're talking to actively. So that listening, you know, can be, um, the words they're using. It can be the tone. It can be the speed that they're talking to you, um, but don't just have, you know, I know convert, we just said to have your agenda, right? To have your bullet points. But at the same time that you have that agenda, you need to be listening to the person you're speaking to and staying active in that conversation. 
Oh, I, I know we, you know, we work with a lot of different companies and, um, you know, one of the, one of the complaints that we get a lot, you know, from, um, hiring managers and, um, is that their staff doesn't really listen. Right. They have their agenda. They have whatever they want to say, but they're not actively listening to see how they can be a problem solver. So I think especially, you know, with administrative assistance and executive assistance, really actively listening um, for how you're being received. And then you can switch things up and stay in the moment. Yeah. This is such an important skill. Uh, something I learned about in 1990 from um, we were living in Virginia Beach and I was just starting in my business and there was a consultant who I got to know through a business group and he was um, Dr. Dennis Coates and he had his PhD and he studied uh, leadership and did a lot of coaching with executives and he taught listening. And I remember since way back, and so I've been talking about it ever since when we, if we do teach listening, um, it's that hearing is, takes little uh, uh, activity on our part. You know, hearing it, it's really passive in a way. It just happens unless you're hearing impaired, but listening is active. Like you really have to stop all the little things that are going on in your head or you have to not be bothered by the distractions around you and you have to listen and so i know when i'm listening when i'm really listening like to you right now it takes work because i have to tune everything else out but i think this is one of the greatest skills because if i'm really listening to you i should be able to pick up on a, a lot of things you know, to pick up, are you interested in what I'm saying? So I'm going to go forward or, oh, no, I've lost you. So I better go back and start at point one. I, this to me is one of the greatest skills that any person can develop. And I know for me, we're also listening, right? Like you said, to pick up on maybe someone's emotions, how they're feeling that day or, or you know, are they feeling defensive about the topic? And so then to me, that ties into emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if I realize you're you're reacting to me and more a little sensitive to what I'm saying, if I'm being emotionally intelligent, I'm going to step back and maybe reframe. So I, this is a critical skill in my mind. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, with all the distractions that we live with today, this is harder today than ever. So if you think we are, always have a phone, right? The phone is always buzzing. There's a text message. There's a notification. There's something that's happening. Maybe it's in our pocket and we're talking to somebody, but we know there's something else happening, right? You know, when, when you're at, at home and watching TV, you're on your phone and you're looking at emails and you're not just watching whatever you're watching. So our listening skills um, and being able to be in that moment with whoever we're talking to is, is it's really hard today. And so I think it's something that you have to think about and think, how can I be in that moment? And I think people struggle with it, you know, quite a bit. And so try to catch yourself. You know, I try to catch myself sometimes when I'm talking to someone and I know that I have gone somewhere else. I'm in the moment in that conversation, mm -hmm. but I have left and I have realized that there's something else in my life that I didn't get done and needs to get done. And then I have to bring myself back and go, no, I'm in a conversation right now and this is what I need to finish. And this is the priority. So I think, you know, see it in yourself. You know, I, I will give a quick story this morning. I was doing an exercise, uh, like a Pilates class this morning and just at my home. And I realized halfway through that I hadn't done something that needed to be done for one of my children this morning as I'm halfway through the class. And I had to force myself to stay in the class to finish it instead of doing what I needed to do. But I had to bring myself back because then I became you know, like my form was off. I wasn't following what was going on. And so that's just an exercise class, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just an example of how quickly our mind can go. And then we're not in the moment. That's really good. Yeah, thank you. It's true. Um, and the other piece, oh, I just want to say really quickly, and then we'll go on to number five, um, because this was something I experienced over the spring. I was um, 
doing a coaching project. I was hired for a coaching project here in town by the president of the organization to work with their executive assistant who had been with them for a year and had a lot of potential, but they brought me in to uh, help observe that assistant for a while. And that's what I do when I'm coaching. I go on site and I observe and I listen and I watch and I ask questions. And so I could actually get a feel for what's going on and learn about the person. And um, he had a lot of great strengths but we were digging in and we had to dig in more as to how that assistant could help their executive. Mm -hmm. And um, so being with that person a few times, what I noticed, um, I would ask a question, he would answer, but it, it was not what I was asking him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to get frustrated after a while. And fortunately, when I'm working as a coach, you know, and they get to know me and I get to know them, then I, I could be a little more direct with them. And he had to work on a development plan and I was asking about it and he was, it had to do with, had he researched and dug in to different technologies, better or technologies they could use to better organize their work. And I, we were in follow up and looking at that plan and I said, did you do that over the past 30 days? Well, I saved us $30 um, in our membership and for the this app. I said, that is not what I asked you. Yeah. I said, did you research and find some new technologies? Uh, well, I saved us money. Mm -mm. Yeah. That's not the question. So I also feel that's where we need to listen. What is the question that is being asked of you so you can deliver the right answer, right? Um, because how do we look if like you can't understand what that question is? Or you're trying to skip ahead or you're, or you're, you're hearing part of a question. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what that is. I know what you're asking me. <laughs> no, you don't always know. So like, yeah. wait, you know, and okay. that's another piece too. If your personality is to jump ahead, if, you know, if you have trouble just waiting for the person to finish what they're saying, <laughs> you know, and sometimes there's generational issues in the workplace, right? You've got maybe the youngest generation working in assistant capacities, and there's, you know, a couple of generations in between who they're supporting, and they're just, their style of communication is different. And right. you know, the person with less business tenure thinks they know exactly what they say, <laughs> okay? and, and you don't, right? So just wait, try to listen. Um, you know, I saw some things going on in the chat of like, it's, you know, it's hard to always listen, but sometimes, you know, taking notes while you're listening to of what they're saying, if they, you know, if they are people that talk longer can be helpful too. Oh, right. Okay. That's great. I love that. Um, I'm going to quickly go back because they, just to confirm the first four we covered, then we'll go to number five. So in case you missed it, number one was AI and future proofing your career. Um, and the main point was learn about AI and utilize it, start using it and, and practicing it, even if you're not able to use it in your workplace. So that will help give you the edge. Number two strategy, elevating communication skills. Our number three, understanding work culture. Number four, which we were just talking about, active listening skills. And number five, we're going to go on to navigating office protocol. So while it's last on the list, these were not in order of priority, but this was to me an important conversation. And I really uh, liked what you said about um, this topic. And I made some of my notes um, and you were speaking in terms of younger team members entering the workforce and making their mark is really crucial. Um, so can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned a little bit of this and, you know, one of the other questions, because a lot of these things. I know, they kind of flow um, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, when you think about the youngest generation in the workforce and how they experienced schooling, right, and if they experienced, you know, 
multiple years of remote schooling, um, you know, whether that was in, you know, the high school setting or that was in the college setting, you know, they perhaps experienced their education a little differently um, than the older generation did. Um, even if you think about internships. So, you know, those that were in college the last four years, how did they experience doing internships? Were the internships also remote where they didn't have as much hands-on or in-person in interaction to really learn how to, you know, conduct themselves. So I think it's, you know, as I mentioned before, it's like thinking about, you know, and asking the questions, be curious about your environment, especially if it's a new environment, or let's say that your environment has been fully remote. And now the company has decided, look, we need to be more hybrid. It's asking those questions. What are things going to be like? You know, what's going to be expected of us in the office? Is it going to be flexible, right, where we, you know, can come in, you know, let's say the job normally starts at 830 in the morning and goes until 530, but it's going to be flexible. So you could arrive, you know, between 830 and 9 or conversely, the company is going to expect that you are there at 829 ready to work, you know, and at your desk with your laptop open. So asking those questions about what the expectation will be. Because when we were at home, right, then, you know, there was no problem. You could roll out of bed in your robe, get on, get on the, you know, on your laptop and you were already working and there was no time delay. So I think, you know, understanding that what sort of flexibility, you know, will be given to you. And I think the youngest generation just has had a lot of flexibility in their education and they're coming into the workplace and they're expecting that same flexibility. And it's, it's there in some companies and it's not there in others. So I think fully understanding, you know, is really really, really important. Great. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to stop us there because I'm sure Malia has questions from our attendees and I want to make sure you have an opportunity to answer their questions. So Malia, do you have some questions for Alexandra? I'm going to let you take all of them. <laughs> it's very exciting there's been a lot in the chat i've been trying to monitor it a little bit while we've been on oh okay good <laughs> let's see if any were in the chat i do have a few questions um so this person said they were recently laid off and they're updating their resume would ai experience be put on the resume and what app aspects pardon me what aspects should be highlighted well, obviously, only if you have AI experience, right? Do you put it on the resume? It's just like any other platform. If you're really great at Excel, you put Excel on there. But if you, you know, if you find yourself to be a user of AI, you could put that. You know, I think, um, you know, people will put excellent prompt writer. You know, we'll see things like that. You know, um, experienced on ChatGPT, experienced on, you know, the other AI platforms. So any of that you could um, you could add on if in your prior job, you know, you had to use AI or you used AI to help make your work product better, then you could make it a bullet point there because on resumes, you know, keywords are searchable. So as you're applying to jobs, um, then if you put those words onto your resume and a, and a company is looking for that particular attribute, you're going to match up. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Rhoda has a, or I, I'm sorry, it's a little confusing in this, the way this was written. A new position titled coordinator was added and she's supposed to be my superior's helper, but she's doing more than what she's supposed to do. How do I step into my position without stepping on toes and making her feel like I'm competing when I'm not? And she put a sideline, by the way, this is a position that he wanted me to have, I'm assuming her boss, but someone else saw different and he's not a fighter when voicing his opinion. <sighs> Well, so I, I mean, I, I think you have, if you're not the person's boss, right, then you can't tell them what they can and cannot do with their job. But if, if it's me, I'm looking for ways in which I'm going to stand out. So if you have somebody that you're working with that wants to do extra work, but you still want to stand out, then you've got to figure out what you can do 
that is going to be above and beyond what this new person is coming in and doing. Awesome. Okay. In the meetings, when you were talking about not being present, not going on camera, um, Mindy would like to know, what if you're just taking notes and listening in? And that, and that's fine, right? If, if, if you're at a meeting and only the speaker is on camera and everyone is off camera, I, the trick that I use is I either come on camera at the very beginning of the meeting to say hello, right? Or I come on camera at the very end of the meeting as we're all saying goodbye. Just another visual to stand out um, that you can do in meetings where maybe you're there to just take notes, you're not really participating or speaking. Okay, thank you. Um, Patty wants to know, in a professional way, how should you handle a very, how should you handle very obvious issues when you're told the position is different than others and as such treated very differently in an unfair way? Look for another job? No. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think you look in every job, there's going to be good things and there's going to be things that maybe you want to shift or change. So, you know, for each person, you have to evaluate if it's the right place for you. If it's not, if there is no opportunity, um, then, you know, you may need to look into a company like mine where we can help you and maybe take a look at your resume and what you're qualified for and give you an understanding of, you know, what's in the market. And is it a good time for you to maybe begin a search? Okay. All right. And then um, Maria would like to know if you know of any offering classes on AI and AI prompting. I don't know of any classes. I will say that on our Robert Half website, we have um, a lot of different um, articles relating to AI and relating to its impact in um, in the work environment and with some suggestions of different things to do. Um, but we're not representing any companies that are that are doing any training on that. Do you know any, Joan? Um, well, yes. I mean, there are some. Yeah, we because we started some tech courses this year. I'm not teaching them, but we have partnered with Mike Song, who's the founder and CEO of Get Control, and he's been doing tech training oh forever. He's amazing. That's why we partnered with him. And so he started introducing AI, um, a course into the, we just completed a whole series. There are six different classes. And so we'll be offering those again in the fall. And then we want to actually try to do something next year that's just AI focused and get some experts to come in and do that. Right. Um, but I, I know there's so much more training going on. And also, also actually, I'm just thinking, we have our enlightened two-day virtual event coming up June 11th and 12th. And one of our segments, um, we have an uh, expert who all she focuses on is AI for assistance. I forgot all about that. Uh, so anyways, if you want to check that out, um, that's coming up June 11 and 12, I believe. <laughs> I should know that by heart. Uh, really quickly, Alexandra, I, I just thought for a minute, you should just, in your own words, it would be nice to, to talk about Robert Happ a little bit what, and what, what you really do, I think in your own words. Yeah. And also how you you do the research on the trends and you have the salary guides and all these wonderful tools. What other, res what resources do you have that maybe these people can access down the road? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so in my own words, so I have um, about 20 years of experience in the recruiting industry. Um, I've been very lucky to spend my career um, in this and, um, it's a career where I've been able to touch a lot of companies and, you know, help thousands, 
probably hundreds of companies and thousands of candidates, um, you know, make moves in in their career and, you know, encourage them to find the best in themselves and look for a company culture that's going to be right for them where they can thrive. And that's what I love about our industry. You know, my company is, is, is a wonderful company that has, um, you know, given me a great platform, you know, to do that. And I think to learn, um, to become a better public speaker. Um, and, you know, we're constantly researching all the trends in the industry. What is, you know, what is happening? What other things are going on where we can make an impact and, you know, how can we find the best candidates for our companies um, and how can we truly help our candidates thrive, you know, in their career. And on our website, there's just countless um, areas that you can help yourself. So whether it's, you know, salary guide trends to figure out if you're making um, what you should be making for your market or it's articles um, in all, all different areas from, you know, office etiquette to work culture, to listening skills, to everything that we've talked about today. You know, our website has different articles that anyone can, you know, tap into. Great. And you're going to be here in October and uh, have a session with different topics in within that session. So if you want to see Alexandra in person, she's going to be here for a few days and she'll have her her particular session, but she'll be here to talk to you and you know give advice and whatever. Just yes, yeah, she's amazing. So did we have any more questions, Amelia? We could take one more if possible, and then I have an announcement for everybody. Uh, let's see, question on understanding work culture. I'm returning from medical leave and noticed on a position from my employer, a listing of core values, which when I was hired last year was never reviewed with me. Is it okay to ask about these when I return? Absolutely. If there's anything that's posted, you know, on your company's website, or maybe they have re-reviewed HR practices, absolutely ask about it. I see that this is new. I would love a, you know, I would love a meeting to discuss um, everything that's on here and make sure that I'm up to date. And one quick short one. Do you have any resources on um, that can that we can use to cultivate listening skills? I mean, in, within our website, as I mentioned, there's, you know, a lot of content uh, around, you know, culture in general, and that will, um, and office etiquette, and all of that touches on listening skills and communication skills. But also, like, you know, it's great to have a recruiter as somebody that you have some regular contact with, even when you're happy in your job and you're not looking to leave. You know, I always suggest to people that there's certain professionals that you should have in your life, right? You need a tax mm -hmm. accountant, but you also need a recruiter and you can always call them and, you know, talk about what's going on in your job and talk to them about listening skills and, and get that consulting that you can get from our profession. Mm -hmm. That's it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Never would think of that, right? It's, it's like, I don't really need one right now. I'm not looking for a job, but and so right. you don't think about that. So that's a great idea too. Thank you for suggesting that. Yes. All right. Well, I know we're going to uh, get close to wrapping it up here so that we respect your time. Again, I want to thank Alexander for being here. I, I just love her so much Aww. and uh, <laughs> all the great information and your it's professionalism. Cool. I mean, you... You evoke everything you talk about. And i that's important, right? And so she will be here in October. So the announcement I have today, if you register between now and June 22nd for our in-person conference this October in Las Vegas, then your name will be entered to win a two-night stay at the Red Rock Resort, which is the venue for our conference. So it's a beautiful a venue and we have held our conference there for at least 12 years maybe more we keep going back because we just love it and um so again if you want to do that maybe you'll get two nights there at the red rock so thank you again alexandra and i know i'll be talking to you before october but i'll see you all hopefully in october at the red rock so looking yeah. forward to it thank you Jen, so much. <laughs> thank you bye everyone bye.